We all have you had a good time today so far? Good. I know um, I was involved in the selection of many of the speakers and I've been so impressed by the presentations. And I've also been very impressed by your comments and your participation. So thank you very much for uh, bringing all that you have to the table, so to speak. Today, my topic is memorization strategies for families. And I hope that by the end of the next hour, you will leave uh, this room with several memorization uh, principles embedded on your heart, written on the fleshy tables of your heart, as well as some very practical strategies that you can begin using tonight with your own children. Uh, that is if you don't come to the family hoedown. <laughs> or tomorrow during the Sunday study period that you might be having for a few hours, um, to help them memorize uh, and write on their hearts the words of our Savior Jesus Christ and his prophets. Um, these are strategies that I hope will be effective for all of you at some level, whether your children are young, whether they're middle-aged children or older children, just about ready to leave the nest. So as a brief overview, presentation, we're going to start by talking about principles. We've talked about the principle approach a number of times, and of course, why we should memorize. We'll also discuss what to memorize, uh, and who should memorize, and how that happens in your families. Um, then we'll look at some strategies, some ideas for you that, again, will be very practical. If you uh, would like to uh, to download a copy of this presentation afterward, that's fine too. These slides will be posted for your use, so don't worry too much about taking copious, frantic notes <laughs> about what's on every slide. Okay, these will be available for you. And I believe those will be available for free, and if they're not, you just write me an email, and I'll send them to you. You can find my email on the <laughs> website of the school. So some of the strategies, uh, we'll talk about passage selection. There are some strategies for choosing passages. It will be more effective in your family memorization efforts than others. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about scripture mastery, about developing your own personal list of memorization, about poems, quotes. We'll talk about using music. Uh, we'll discuss storytelling, games, tracking systems, routines, performances, incentives, and praise. And so I hope you'll leave with a better understanding of each of those. So first of all, why memorize? One of my favorite scriptures on this topic, there are so many, I just, it was hard for me to narrow it, but I thought I'd give you a couple um, on uh, why I think it's important for you to memorize and to begin now with your children while they're young. Doctrine and Covenants section one, the whole chapter is a preface to the Doctrine and Covenants, the collection of revelations that uh, is a foundational, canonical work of scripture in our church, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and after many of these revelations have been written, the Lord revealed to Joseph Smith um, that they should be bound and collected, and, and he gives them a very interesting rationale for why that is in Doctrine and Covenants section 1, which is not the first revelation, but is one that was kind of the uh, cover revelation to explain the others. So I'm going to read some of these to you, just some of this reasoning. You hear the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ very tenderly. You also hear his reasoning. Um, and so listen to this carefully as I read it to you. I'm not going to read the whole section, just a few verses. Starting in verse um, 17, he says, Wherefore, I am the Lord, knowing the calamity that should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments, and also gave commandments to others, that they should proclaim these things unto the world. And all this, that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets. The weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones, that man should not counsel his fellow arm, or fellow man, neither trust in the arm of flesh, but that every man might speak in the name of the Lord, even the Savior of the world. We'll go on in just a, a moment. In the scriptures, you'll often see the word that. And that means so that. It often means that in the scripture. Not in every case, but usually it means so that. Um, so let me reread that. He called Joseph Smith and others. Why? So that they should proclaim these things unto the world, so that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets, the weak things of the world would uh, come forth and break down the mighty strong ones. 
Amen. And should, so that man should not counsel his fellow man, neither trust in him the flesh, but so that every man might speak in the name of the Lord, in the name of God, the Lord, even the Savior of the world. That's why he gave us the doctrine of covenants, so that every man, woman, and child could speak in the name of the Lord. He wants us to speak in his name. He wants us to uh, become Ephesians 4.13, till we all come in the unity of the faith. That's why he gave us apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. Right? So, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's why he gave us prophets. That's why he gives us their words, so we can be perfected. Um, continuing in Dr. Covenants 1, so that faith might increase in the earth, so that my everlasting covenant might be established, so that the fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and simple unto the ends of the world and before kings and rulers. But I am God and have spoken it. These commandments are me and were given unto my servants in their weakness after the manner of their understanding so that they might come into understanding. And of course I'm replacing that so with so that there. And inasmuch as they erred, it might be made known. And inasmuch as they sought wisdom, they might be instructed. Inasmuch usually means to the degree that, to the degree that they erred, it might be made known. To the degree that they sought wisdom, that they might be instructed. So all of these are good reasons to memorize scriptures, to to uh, to learn the scriptures very very well. And of course, in Doctrine and Covenants 88, one, it, it, section 88, verse 188, the Lord says uh, that we should treasure up in our hearts. The scriptures, so that ye may be prepared in all things when I send you again to testify and warn the people. Uh, how many of you want your children to go on missions, especially now that the ages are lower? I know you do, and they will be more prepared as missionaries, clearly, if they have um, stored up in their minds and made up treasures in their minds of the scriptures. So of course, those are some key, key principles. You know, there are some risks, too. Uh, Elder Nelly Maxwell said, um, our being saved by gaining knowledge obviously refers to a particular form of knowledge, a knowledge of God and knowledge of the things of God. So there's a danger that just learning a few scriptures, you'll remember this idea of the prophets, can sometimes make you think you know a great deal when you don't. <laughs> so just because your family can recite 10 or 15 scriptures, doesn't mean necessarily that you have the knowledge of God, right? You need to teach, and we'll talk about this, um, the scriptures in a way that sinks deeply into their hearts and changes them, right? It goes unto their hearts and they let it into their hearts so that they can become men and women of Christ. In addition, brothers and sisters, goes on Elder Maxwell, multiple scriptures make it clear that knowledge is meant to be closely associated with other virtues. So this is the caution, right? The risk is that you can become puffed up by having knowledge, instead of having not just knowledge, but also other virtues such as patience, humility, charity, and kindness. And so when we teach our children why we're memorizing, uh, we also should teach them that this is one of the attributes of God, and God is also kind, patient, or humility, <laughs> you know, has humility, charity, and kindness. Um, that was a statement made by Elder Maxwell in a wonderful devotional address at BYU, which was later, uh, well, it's posted there. It's called The Inexhaustible Gospel. Um, and you can find that readily online. Scripture power. You know, we talk about uh, gaining power. Great power. Elder Richard G. Scott said this two years ago. Great power can come from memorizing scriptures. To memorize the scriptures to forge a new friendship. It is like discovering a new individual who can help in time of need, give inspiration and com comfort and be a source of motivation for needed change. So, uh, many of you remember, perhaps you've heard of um, those in the concentration camps, for example, who have things memorized and could entertain themselves. Well, hopefully none of us end up in concentration camps, but we might end up on a, you know, lonely sometime, on a bus, or in a little bit of a hard situation, or maybe even without pencil or paper or scriptures to read, or some other book then is a time when we can take those friends, that internal property that becomes ours when we memorize, that no one can take from us. Let them take what they will, take our homes, take our, our possessions of any kind. No one can take from you that which you memorize. 
They just can't do it. And it will become a friend to you in time of need, give you inspiration and comfort. Of course, we know that there's great power in teaching our children, too. We talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies so that our children may know to what source they may look for remission of their sins. Of course, this applies to the scriptures generally. Maybe not memorization necessarily all in a, a, you know, by itself, but um, that is one of the reasons why we memorize scriptures, so that they can come to look for remission of their sins when perhaps those words will be called back by the Holy Ghost to their mind and uh, they'll be inspired to choose the right or avoid sin. Other principles, just briefly with all I can get understanding. Again, uh, this is Proverbs 4, 7. We'll talk a little bit about that, about getting understanding uh, and some of the strategies that we'll discuss will lead to that and research, reasoning, relating strategies, all those that we listed. The art of memory is the art of understanding. If you understand something truly, you're far more likely to remember it than if you're memorizing gibberish. Right? So it's important we understand. Seek not to declare my word, but first seek to obtain my word, and then shall your tongue be loosed. So um, it's, you know, Hiram Smith was told to obtain the word, and then his tongue would be loosed. And from my own personal experience, not claiming to be a master scriptorian or to have memorized all that I hope to memorize, but in my life, certainly no. But I, I do believe and know wholeheartedly that my tongue has been loosed many times because of the uh, scriptures that I have memorized, both in my own home, or sorry, my, my parents' home, uh, my own home, and uh, in recent years with my children. Okay, um, how uh, the Lord delivers some of that power, of course, is through the Holy Ghost. Right? He brings all things to our remembrance. He will be sent to bring all things to our remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So when we're studying the scriptures, here's a key point. It's important to um, remember that these are words of the Lord to us. To think that he, that whatsoever his prophets speak when moved upon by the Holy Ghost shall be scripture. Shall be the will of the Lord, shall be the mind of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, and the power of God unto salvation that when, when his prophets speak, it's as if he's speaking. Those things can be brought to our remembrance if, we'll, if we study them enough that we can feel that they're being said to us. Right? We should study our scriptures long enough each day, in my opinion, until the Spirit comes. Don't just study five minutes and check off the list. Oh, I got my study done. I read a chapter real fast. Right? We study until the Lord speaks to us. Because when he speaks to us, that's uh, what's going to to stay in our hearts. And that may not be an audible voice. You know, most of the time it will not. <laughs> but uh, till that spirit enters your heart, the Holy Ghost carries things into or unto your heart. Um, we should study that long, at least. And then as Elder Richard Scott, sometimes we can, we can, he says we should ask, what more? What next? <laughs> you know, stay on our knees or keep asking. Okay, scripture card. I'd like us to sing this song together. I know you know this. If you haven't heard it yet, then welcome to a wonderful song. It was actually written in 1987 by Clyde Romney. Um, but this scripture song is written for primary children and helps them understand the blessings of, memory, of, of scripture study, okay? Which is an antecedent to scripture memorization. <laughs> so, mm, if you'll just join me. Because I want to be like the Savior and I care. I'm reading his instructions, I'm following his plan. Because I want the power his word will give to me. I'm changing how I live, I'm changing what I'll be. Scripture power keeps me safe from sin. Scripture power is the power to win. Scripture power, every day I need the power that I get each time I read. I'll find the sword of truth in each scripture that I learn. I'll take the shield of faith from these pages that I turn. I'll wear each vital part of the armor of the Lord and fight my daily battles and win my great reward. Scripture power keeps me safe from sin. Scripture power is the power to win. 
30 more seconds to finish up. And while you're finishing up, uh, we're passing out a sheet of paper. testimony to your children. What did you just learn um, from this exercise? Did you learn anything? Yes. Yes. Bearing testimony brings the spirit so that they want to. Who should bear testimony in a family? Everybody. How often? Often. Every day. Right? We should bear testimony to our children. That is a powerful way to help the words sink from our minds down to our hearts. And at this school, this conference, we're all about educating hearts and minds. Hearts are the high road to the mind. And uh, testifying is one of those great ways. Um, what did you learn from the music that we sang? How do you feel when you're singing a hymn 
that in the First Presidency message at the beginning of the hymn book says, ours are doctrinal. They are doctrinal, um, you know, they're laden, they're drenched in doctrine, many of the hymns. Neil and Maxwell said, give some little streams, not that drenched in doctrine, but, you know, there are a lot of hymns that are doctrinally drenched, yes. That's right. It's imagery, it's poetic, it can connect you in a way that sometimes regular words do not. And the, J. Ruben Clark did say that a man could grow nearer to the Lord, he thinks, through, through music than perhaps any other thing than through prayer. Um, you know, of course, but reading Book of Mormon is there. But it's one of those most powerful means to help us feel the Spirit, to help us draw close to the Lord, especially doctrinal hymns. Yes? experience, your house is a, a den and a ruckus, and then you turn on some nice church music and things just calm down. Yeah, I have. Lots of ways. That kind of music, especially every day, but as, and especially on the Sabbath, can make a big difference to inviting the Spirit and calming our children and getting them into the mood to do scripture study and scripture memorization. In fact, when they have, it may be a stepping stone to scripture memorization because they memorize those hymns. If we can talk about those and help them see the meaning of them, then those hymns will come to their mind, as Boyd K. Packer said, sometimes when they're having temptation or uh, in other, uh, other occasions. There was one other comment over here. Go ahead. That's right. These songs will stay with them beyond just the end of that last beat, right? And they'll be singing their favorite tune, right, as they go about their work. Wonderful insight, Sean. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so she's over here, Sean. We're done. So, um, all right. Scripture uh, power. Of course, there are some scriptures that we should memorize. The brethren have encouraged and challenged all seminary age youth to memorize the 100 scripture mastery scriptures. Most of us attended seminary know what those are. Again, they're very easily accessible online. And um, I would encourage you also to create a favorite list, a list of favorite quotes, your own personal list. Recently, there's a story, Mr. Beckwith is our head of school here at the school. He shared with us a collection of poems and scriptures and other wonderful, most meaningful um, readings uh, from his mom. So for years, she had been collecting these items, and she gave them, she bound them in a nice binder, and she gave them to her children, tactically arranged, and, and uh, of course, that's, that's a wonderful Christmas gift or birthday gift idea for any of your children. Um, I have a favorite poem by my mother, Linda Anderson. She passed away when I was young. She wrote a poem before she died um, called Best. And um, these are things that we should memorize too. Right? We should be connected and turn our hearts to our fathers and, and the fathers to the children too, um, I think, through memorization. Here's what her poem says. And while I invest my time in good, best waits round along with should. Should grows larger with neglect. Still best maintains status select. Bad and worst, they never touch. For I am much too careful, much, to let those evil ends drop me of blessings in eternity. When judgment calls for an account, and I the witness charity mount, at my defense, good will rise. 
yet best and should will tell no lies. The sentence fair can only be a good reward assigned to me, yet glories I will never know would be assigned to justly go to an investor in the best who would not be content with less. So that was written long before Downey Jokes talk on good, better, best, but it has that same idea, right? That inspired her to always choose the best, not just the good, but to go for the best. I'm sure every one of you can come up with some inspiring personal scripture. That scripture we read earlier said, we write, it didn't just say the prophets write, <laughs> we write so that our children may know to what source they may look for their mission of their sin. So I encourage you to write personal family mission statements, personal family mottos, uh, poems, and say those things, even if they're just a, a one-liner, like Andersons are on time, <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, those things will come back to them years later. Andersons are kind, right? Uh, I teach a family science course here on campus, and I asked the students to go interview their parents and ask what their family motto was. And one student said, um, Sydney Young, she said, she interviewed her mom. Her mom said, um, be patient with every, let's see, be nice to everyone and patient with mean people. It's a pretty good thought, right? <laughs> be nice to everyone, patient with mean people. That's personal family advice that gets repeated often enough that the children know it, and it comes back to them, okay? Personal choices mean much. They mean a lot when the children are choosing what they memorize, too. And so in our scripture memorization, scripture study, I ask my children, we play some games I'll tell you about in a minute, but I say, you know, uh, I want you to mark at least one verse while we're reading this chapter today. <laughs> and uh, they do, at least the three oldest, to know how to do that. They mark their their scriptures, and then I say, so why did you mark that? Tell me what you marked and why. And those scriptures are for, far more likely to remain in their hearts, in their memories, even if they don't have them verbatim memorized, because they marked them, and because they explained them. The person who does the talking does the learning. Uh, and so those, if I talk, 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 talk out my children, all scripture study, they won't remember as much. They may remember, and of course I do. I think they're great places for lecture, right? Uh, but, um, but if they do the talking, that again is a form of, of learning and testifying. So give them a choice. And again, we see that memorization doesn't necessarily always have to be verbatim memorization. It can be memorization that we're writing it on the fleshy tables of the heart uh, in a way that should come back to them later. Okay? Passage selection. Uh, this is another quote from Neil Maxwell, Jesus the Perfect Mentor. It start, this was originally a BYU devotional and then was um, adapted for the Ensign in February 2001. He said, each of us from time to time is mentored and has chances to mentor. In my experience, truthful and caring one-liners that occur within such nurturing relationships have a long shelf life. One-liners. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a minute. You can probably recount three or four examples of how people have said something, probably a sentence or clause, and you remember it still. It moves and touches you still. Such has been the case with me. Okay, we'll talk about those one-liners uh, a little in a minute. Music, um, 13 Articles of Faith. Often, uh, many of you probably have noticed, at least I think I've noticed, that more children know the 13 Articles of Faith now because they've been set to music than probably when you and I were very, very young. Um, <clears throat> Make your recitations musical. Uh, here at the school, I have had a few of my children come here to the school, and they memorize scriptures every term. They have a few verses and passages or poems that they memorize. And one of them, they memorize is Psalm 100. It's like seven verses long. And they don't set it to music, but they almost set it to music. Okay? I can still hear it because the inflections going up and down are, are magical. And everyone, I've seen the whole uh, you know, first grade kindergarten class, actually, it's all kindergarten, this demonstrates that kindergartners can learn long passages, recite Psalm 100. And they say it like this. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, 
His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. That's exactly how every kindergarten at school says it. Their inflection is musical. It wasn't music. They're not playing the piano. What's the lesson for our families? You can do it, right? You can choose passages and make them musical. Okay, I don't want to belabor that point. Okay, back to one-liners. Here are a few passages uh, that are very good for young children, I think. Um, they're also probably good for older children, middle children. These are some that I like in the New Testament. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Is that a hard memorization? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen words. How much is contained in that memorization? Right? A lot. The whole story of Mary receiving this news that she is going to become the, the mother of the Son of God. Um, Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? The Savior, right? In those few words, that's a one-liner that will come back to your children and tell them, uh, you know, yeah, I should be about my father's business. <laughs> Especially if they learn it in context of the story. Right? Uh, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Again, nine words. Very powerful. Right? I will follow the Lord. And you can discuss these. In fact, this reminds me of Elder Holland. Elder Holland is a master at this, right? He, he chooses one-liners from the scriptures, and other apostles do too. But for example, this last conference, he talked about, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Right? That one-liner from the scriptures. And he told us a story in a way that we all remember it. And he helped us see the principle that we should always put our faith before our doubt, that we should always um, focus on what we believe first and what we, we know, and we should trust in the belief of others. And we should pray to the Lord for greater faith. So I would encourage you, um, in fact, I, I, if you have your scriptures, or even if you don't, um, again, this goes to your own storehouse of memorizations. Will you share with your neighbor a one-liner or two? Now, this one's not a whole passage, right? You're not going to recite DNC section 4 or <laughs> some long passage, right? You're going to recite a one-liner that has meaning to you. If you can't think of one, maybe, it's, uh, maybe think of something your mother used to tell you, a family one-liner. Okay, share that with your neighbor and... Explain it for just a minute, testify of it, etc. Okay? Two or three minutes, ready to begin. Thirty more seconds. OK. 
okay. I can see there's a lot of good discussion going on. I hate to cut it off. Um, the point of this exercise is that it's pretty easy to go from a one-liner into a very rich conversation, right? And the, the one-liners are like punchlines, okay? Punchlines to stories or jokes. I've given you all these scriptures that are on the overhead slide, on the back of the, or on one of the sides of the page that we passed out. Those are some favorites from just the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are hundreds of these. And, you know, it shows that by small and simple things, right, can, can we start a great thing. Great things can be brought past great discussions. These are the punchlines that we memorize. At the top of that, I put another example from Hubie Brown. Many of you remember the story, I'm the master gardener here, and I know what you know, I want you to be. Well, that's the punchline they need to memorize, right? The rest of the details, they'll get. And you ought to tell the story about how he was in the army and how he wanted to move up the ranks and how because he was LDS or perhaps because he was LDS, he was not selected. And he was just so angry that he remembered or upset, he remembered um, a conversation that he had had with a rose bush in his plant, in his garden, where he had cut down the rose bush and had said, as the rose bush seemed to talk to him, why do you cut me down? I was growing so beautifully. <laughs> and I'm not quoting it verbatim, right? I got the gist. And he said to them, uh, to the rose bush, I'm the master gardener here, and I know what I want you to be. If I let you grow the way you want to grow, you become all woody, right? There won't be currants. The current, yeah, not rose bush, current bush. There won't be current berries. You become woody and filled with leaves and wood, and I want you to grow berries. So I gotta cut, cut you out. So I am the master gardener here, and I know what I want you to do. That's what you have your children memorize. Is that doable? Can you start with something small and simple like that? They'll learn to love it if, if it's achievable. And um, you, know, you have them teach those, tell those stories too, right? Lord, I believe, help on my unbelief, but where are the nine? You talk about gratitude, you get this great conversation about how you talk to ten people today and say thank you, thank you, thank you, wherever you go. Say that you relate it to, to uh, Way to Be by President Hinckley, where his very first B is be grateful. And say thank you to anyone who does anything, even anything for you. Just say thank you to them. You testify of that principle, and, they, and then you quiz them. So what did the, what did the Savior say? But where are the nine? Do you think he cares that we're grateful? Yeah. Will you be grateful? You say thank you in your prayers tonight. Yeah, let's do a prayer right now. Let's say thank you. And then you say a prayer and you express nothing but gratitude. Other uh, Bednar talked about that. How one time as president of BYU, uh, General Authority visiting, um, I think it was a prophet, came down and said, oh no, other irony, let's just pray. And they had just had a death in their family that day. And he challenged the sister Bednar to say a prayer and only express thanks. So they did learn important lessons from that about how it is so important to say thank you. So, okay, why don't you, I know you've done this. Uh, let's, let's do 30 seconds more. Choose one of these on the board. Talk about it for 60 seconds with your neighbor. Both of you talk. Any one of these. 30 seconds, talk, talk, talk. So we talked about storytelling. We talked a little bit about Jeffrey R. Holland, about having children tell the stories, giving them opportunities. That leads into the topic of performances and teaching times, right? Having your children teach anytime you can during scripture study, family you know, evening, car rides, vacation rides. Uh, I know the Olsons here, they even have a microphone in their car so they can turn it into a teaching time. <laughs> And I've been trying to figure out how to do that. I'm going to get rich on that. When I start selling them, you can all buy one for me. I'm just kidding. Just joking. Okay. Uh, of course, we all know stories have a long shelf life, and that's really key. So bedtime stories, here's a new idea, right? you got your one-liners. I just give you 20 or so. 
And for the next 20 nights, there's no excuse for not having a bedtime story. <laughs> and in the meantime, spend an hour or two on a Sunday gathering uh, more, more of these one-liners from the scriptures. Okay, games, gamification. This is just the concept of making it fun, right? Even just randomizing it. Simply, we used to have a cup in our home where we'd write scriptures, the, re the uh, verse on a popsicle stick. And we'd shake up the cup and say, who wants to pick? It was so fun to pick it because it was a surprise, right? That changes their attitude toward memorization. And then they'd choose it and we'd all recite it as a family or we'd let them recite it as a child. Cupcake tins with prizes. This is an idea also I took from the Olsons who have been good family friends for a decade or more. Um, they, uh, a couple of decades, they, uh, you may have been in their presentation earlier, but they have cupcake tins where they'll sometimes uh, put little candies or treats, and some of them are more desirable than others, you know, but after you participate in scripture study and you mark your verse, this is, you know, if you read and follow along, you get one roll of the dice, and then you get to choose, you know, one of those treats. If you mark a scripture and can tell me why you marked it, I'll give you two rolls, you know. So inexpensive to be positive, uh, you know, reinforce a little bit extrinsically, but reinforce it with a great um, way to, to make this kind of like a game. Fill in the blanks. You may have seen that the church has a scripture mastery app for the uh, Seminary Scripture Masteries. Um, if you don't have to have this app, if you don't have an iPhone, you can't get it. An iPhone or iPad, yet, but I'm sure the church will make that available. Um, you know, you can fill in the blanks here. This is I got 11 different versions of kind of letting you see First Nephi 3, 7, and then they take out the words. Even that is fun for your children to say, and it came to pass that I, Nephi, said unto my father that I would go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded, right? Yeah, so that's a little gamification. Tracking, here is a um, Suzuki-style music tracker. This is uh, my daughter's Viola tracking sheet for viola. Oh, I said that for viola. <laughs> Looks a little bit like the rainbow. And she has to learn in book one all these songs, and there's a review trail. You can apply this to scripture study as a family, the Book of Mormon trail. So this is ours a, few, a month or two ago. We have all these scriptures in the scripture mastery of the Book of Mormon that we wanted to pass off. We have others that are not scripture mastery, that are then our favorite one layers, our favorite uh, poems. Uh, but uh, as we go down, we just color them in. That's gamification at some level. It's also um, very helpful to have that posted. It's helpful to review, to make sure that you really master the first few uh, before you go on to too many. Some people find that helpful anyway. We as a family have found it helpful. Daily routines. Right? Have a daily family review, five to seven minutes. My parents did this faithfully, and it's why I am so grateful. It's one of the most important things I'm grateful for my parents. They're wonderful, wonderful people. They taught me to love scriptures and scripture memorization through five to seven minutes in connection with our scripture study, which usually lasted about 15 to 20 minutes. And each day, usually at 6.30 in the morning when we were bleary-eyed, we'd sing a song that would help us kind of wake up and help us have the spirit not fight, and those types of things. And then we'd go into recitation. We'd review three to four verses a day. And we would just recite them as a family, three to four times each. That will pay off. I know it seems uh, sometimes hard to do that because our children are, are restless or maybe they're not old enough. But even the young ones are learning. Um, and I'm grateful to see how some of the same fruits in my children that they We'll hear our scripture being said in the general conference, and they start mouthing it along because they know that one. <laughs> we recited it, <laughs> so they can say it too. So again, by small and simple things, just start with a few minutes a day, five to seven minutes, where you start reciting a few scriptures a few times. Start with the scripture mastery. makes a big difference. Daily personal review. I remember a friend, Christopher and Tammy Bauer, they would recite scriptures as they'd go running together, or as she would do laundry, she would have her scripture memorization cards and she would just try to use those extra minutes and it was her daily personal routine anytime i'm uh, out and about some i even post them in my car she posts them in her car and uh, you know if she's waiting i don't necessarily i'm not saying distracted driving don't do while you're driving but you know if you're waiting in the car to pick up your children at, at the friend's home or at, you know some place that they go to visit then um, use that moment by small and simple things again are great things brought to pass. I want you to start, just start small. 
routines. Uh, Richard G. Scott said this at the last general conference, be wise in how you embrace technology. Mark important scriptures on your device and refer to them frequently. A few young people would review a verse of scripture as often as some of you send text messages. You could soon have hundreds of passages memorized. Those passages would prove to be a powerful source of inspiration and guidance by the Holy Ghost in the times of need. Hundreds. That's my goal for my children. I want them to have hundreds of scriptures memorized. I want them to know most of the hymns, perhaps all, most of the primary songs, perhaps all. I want them to have those floating in their minds wherever they go and ready at the tip of their tongue to bear testimony and explain, give every man a reason for the hope that is in them. Um, that was just again last week. Well, performances. We have our children stand at the, on the hearth. <laughs> they love that. <laughs> they stand, you know, they'll stand up and we say, use your orator's voice. And we do this standard every, you know, every Sunday or even on family meeting. It, does, it could be any time, really, right? Stand up on the uh, stool or the chair or the hearth or whatever you have and give us that scripture and then bear your testimony or tell us about it. Um, we recite Psalm 100 at Thanksgiving dinner, right? Uh, the children recite that at certain um, traditional times. Give them applause and praise, you know, and they, or, or smiles, encouragement. Incentives, um, just another plug for positive incentives. Uh, they can help until motivation becomes int extrinsic or intrinsic. Not negative incentives, right? We don't spank or punish our children for not memorizing scriptures. We don't, you know, maybe spank at all, but uh, certainly some of those incentives. I memorized the poem F when I was about eight years old because my grandfather said, I'll give you $5 if you memorize this poem. <laughs> I am so glad he did that. <laughs> I do not feel cheated. I do not feel spoiled that someone bribed me to memorize. It says in that poem, if you can keep your head when all about you are you losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet, don't, and yet not look too good or talk too much. Nice. That it keeps going. If you can, if you can uh, talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, or lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you be a man, my son. The two lines that probably have come to my mind most frequently are, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting. <laughs> Sometimes I'm lying at a store and I think, okay, I'm waiting, <laughs> and I'm going to be happy. And I'm not going to be tired, I'm going to do something. Or, um, you know, if you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, right? Sometimes when things turn gossipy, you know, to say only those things that you would say if the person were here, and to say the good, positive things you know about those, those people. Date to a restaurant for a week. Perfect practice, right? We've used this before. Our children, I have to say, uh, you know, they, they have learned a lot of music or others. Um, uh, they've done lots of things for, for simple rewards, right? We'll take them on a date when we go on our date once in a while if they all do something for a week. Uh, other families, other presenters have talked a little bit about this, and that's, that can be good. Okay, praise. I'm just about out of time, five minutes. Research of Carol Dweck, she's an educational researcher at Stanford. She has written extensively for many years research on the topic of praise and effective praise. She says that we should give praise that is specific and focus on effort primarily. She, uh, you know, they did tests where they'd have students take a math test and they would praise a control group for their ability. Oh, you're really smart. You are smart. This ability, they use the B verb, you are something. And then they took another group and they said, you know, we're going to focus on praising this person when they finish on saying, good work, you know, you worked hard, I can see how you did this, you know, you stuck to it. Praise their effort, um, their tenacity, their strategy. That group was far more willing to take another test than the group that was put up on some pedestal and didn't know why, because it was very general praise. The prophets talk about this. Millie Maxwell says, we need to give others the garment of praise often, but he, he, he uses the words frequently, specific, deserved commendation. They shiver for want of praise. And meanwhile, each of us has far more opportunities for bestowing deserved praise than we ever use. Right? We could all be far more praising in our conversation. How long since you've done that? Perhaps today, for many of you. Perhaps maybe too long for some of you, since you've praised. 
Here are a couple of examples from the scriptures, right? Matthew 16, the Lord praises. He gives us a good example here. He says, Peter, you know, who do the people say that I am? And the apostles said, well, some say that you're Elias or the prophets. But who say ye that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Peter responds. And the Savior praises him. Notice this pattern. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Good job, Simon. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You got it because you listened to the Holy Ghost, right? And upon this rock, which is the rock of Revelation, I will build my church. So he instructed him, good job. You know, you, so when we praise our children and say, hey, good job, you recited that scripture perfectly. For you, I can see, maybe you don't perfectly, maybe you say, you, you really worked hard to memorize that scripture. That is the kind of hard work that's going to let you become a great missionary for the Lord. Right? Where that scripture is going to come back to your mind sometime when you need it. You praise them and you instruct them specifically, just as the Savior did. There are lots of examples of this in the scriptures. Hebrews 10, 8, 1 through 8, the Lord praises Nephi for being so faithful in preaching his word and says, I'm going to give you this, blessed art thou, you know, you've been faithful in preaching the word ever since, uh, you know, you, you've done it without fear of men, with unwearyingness. He's specifically praising the kinds of actions that Nephi took. And now I'm going to give you the sealing power and go. You know, so you actually give a responsibility and Matthew Peter was given the responsibility to help build the church. Alma, same thing. Go back to Ammoniah. You've been faithful since you received the word. And I was the angel who told it to you. Okay. Scriptural patterns of praise. This is the concluding, concluding thought. A sincere statement of general praise. This is in the scriptures all over. I can show you um, several, many, many examples of the Savior speaking this way to his um, disciples. A sincere statement of general praise followed by a specific description of what behavior was praiseworthy, an explanation that teaches, broadens the view, or deepens the understanding of the individual who has been praised, an explicit or implicit command or stewardship to which the praised person should now apply him or herself. Right? Good job. You memorized that. Will you go share that with your grandma? You gave them now a responsibility to take it one step further. Right? Thank you for memorizing that. Will you... Um, now, will you show me what you memorized next week? <laughs> Maybe you've got that on a chart. But you keep them with responsibility and you praise them for the good things that they do. That is uh, perhaps one of the most powerful, powerful methods is letting them know how pleased you are with them. I know I've been grateful for the people who uh, have been pleased with me and I hope that I can hear and we can hear. Well done, that good faithful servant. Yeah. And I hope that amidst the busyness of the world, we don't lose sight of, of these, um, the power of memorization to keep us balanced, to simplify our lives, to reduce it from, uh, and to, to even catch us sometimes in the hectic moments. Um, all right, any final thoughts you want to share? I challenge you then to go ahead and begin um, more earnestly to write down a scripture memorization plan for your family. Write it down tonight. Write it down for even just five minutes right now in your notes. Write it in your journal tonight. Then take action on it and you will see fruits from it. Uh, I believe that's the case. I know it's the case in my own life. In my own life. And I show that to the name of Jesus Christ in it. Thank you so much for your participation. One more thing, sorry, I'm gonna hold your break just a little bit. I just wanted to show you, this was something I made when I was about 16, some of my favorite quotes. It's not um, complete, it's an old one that I found, but you can start your children, or task them with collecting their favorite quotes. Do it now from Spencer W. Kimball. I had quotes I put up on my rooms. Put those up on your rooms. Live your life so that those who know you but don't know him will want to know him because they know you. Poems, you're telling yourself what friends you seek, whatever. These types of things will help. Have them, you create your own, have them create their own um, poems, the scripture. This is a list of scripture memorization my family, when I was growing up, had about uh, 200 plus scriptures there. And anyway. Uh, these, uh, some of them will, yeah.
Oh, yeah, I'll share my mother's phone. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I'll do that. Thank you. I can't, Andy. Any others? Yeah, Paul, uh, it's just family call. Just ask me. I'll, I'll post it with the other slides. Oh, you'll get it at the latterdaylearning.org website. We'll link to our CVET website, which is how you register. You'll also find it on latterdaylearning.org, which is the website for this Latter-day Learning conference and the curriculum that we provide. latterdaylearning.org.